Carl Sagan was on TV and I was entranced by his show, Cosmos, and he was talking about black holes and neutron stars and I sort of said to Dad, you know, that's what I want to do. And he said, no, that's nonsense, uh, stick to engineering. So I went into the university the next day and changed courses over to science. He didn't talk to me again for 10 years, but we're all good now. Uh, so here I am at Swinburne. I'm the director of a national center. We're searching for gravitational waves. We're searching for fast radio bursts. We're using billion dollar telescopes and I'm like a child in a candy store. And so we've built some of this technology um, to inspire the next generation to get into this tech and understand science. So I'm gonna give you a, a tour of the universe. I'm gonna um, show you some of this technology and then talk a little bit about what we're doing with supercomputers in order to make these discoveries. I'm inspired by these four gentlemen. Sorry, they're all guys, but it was a long time ago. Um, Galileo was the first person to take a telescope and point it at the heavens. And when he did so, he looked at Jupiter, and what did he see? That there were actually moons going around Jupiter. And this transformed our understanding of the universe because we went from being in a universe where the Earth was at the centre of the universe until we had one where we were, although no longer at the centre of the universe, um, the sun was. And so he combined the technology of the telescope and pointed it at the heavens, and that's what we've been doing ever since. Kepler was the first person who used the laws of mathematics to understand how the planets moved around the sun. He knew that everything moved around in ellipses. He couldn't understand why. He thought it was God imposing the, the beauty of mathematics onto um, the laws of motion. But it wasn't until Newton came along that he showed that his universal law of gravitation, combined with differential and integral calculus, which he invented whilst on leave during the Great Plague, um, could explain how things moved in the heavens. It wasn't some mysterious God-given trajectory, although he was a very religious man, it was actually the laws of mathematics and these laws of physics. Einstein, uh, a more modern day hero to physicists, realized that if there were any parallels between electromagnetic mag magnetism and gravity, these mysterious things called gravitational waves should be propagating throughout the universe. And he pulled out his pen and paper and he calculated the impact these gravitational waves would, would have on everyday matter and he realized it was absolutely hopeless to ever try and detect them. He also postulated that black holes should exist. If you could compress the Earth to the size of a pea, it would turn into a black hole. And if two black holes could coalesce, the, the amplitude of the gravitational wave that would travel throughout the universe would be so strong that even then you couldn't detect it. But that was before quantum optics, the invention of the laser. Unfortunately, my colleagues and I, um, have been studying these things. These are neutron stars. Neutron stars are radio pulsars. They emit beams of radiation. And every time they go past your radio telescope, you get like a heartbeat pulse. Um, they're incredibly dense. A teaspoon weighs a, a billion tons. And if you dropped a brick on one of these things, it would give off as much energy as an atomic bomb. Fortunately, these things occur in pairs in our own galaxy. Our galaxy has about 100 billion stars. It has about 10 million of these things, and about 1% of them are in what we call binaries. They go around each other. And they travel around each other every few hours, and the orbit shrinks by a massive three millimeters. They're separated by about a million kilometers, and every orbit, they shrink by about three millimeters. In 100 million years, they get so close to each other that they give off gravitational waves at a terrifying rate, and they merge, and there should be an explosion in the heavens and a burst of gravitational waves. So because we knew about these things, many of which had been discovered in Australia, if one of these happened in the nearest million galaxies and we fired a James Bond style laser down two vacuum tubes four kilometers long at the expense of about 400 million US dollars, um, the mirrors should vibrate by one ten thousandth of the width of a proton, which is pretty small, and we can easily detect that. So during commissioning, <laughs> turned on the laser, tested everything's working, and lo and behold, a gravitational wave passed through the Earth, caused the mirrors to shake in a sort of jiggly way, and you can see the trace up there on the side was how space-time was compressed in the four-kilometer-long vacuum tubes. 
Shortly, this data is going to be flowing to Australia because the federal government announced the first National Gravitational Wave Data Centre will be headquartered here at Swinburne. We'll have about a dozen software engineers getting a live stream from this, what I like to think of as a telescope, they'd call it a detector, and we'll be detecting gravitational waves just in the building opposite the railway line. This is what occurs when the two stars go around each other. There's a, a gravitational wave which is propagating out. It travels literally a billion light years, and by the time it reaches Earth, these imperceptible tremors happen at a rate of once every few milliseconds. The first gravitational wave was detected by two black holes, each 30 times the mass of the sun, and the sun is about 300,000 Earth masses. And they tore each other apart, going around each other every few milliseconds, and we could actually detect that. The leaders of the project won the Nobel Prize in 2017, um, as well as many other prizes. But we have this problem that when the gravitational wave goes past, we're not exactly sure where it comes from. And this particular uh, map of the sky um, shows what it's like to try and de detect whereabouts in the sky these things come from. So that red streak is actually what we call the error box. So when two black holes merge, we get a streak on the sky. We're not sure where it is we need to look in order to um, detect the gravitational wave. And unfortunately, when black holes merge, nothing happens except gravitational waves come out, which you can't see with normal everyday telescopes. On the 17th of August in 2017, two neutron stars smashed together. Keep in mind, these things are half a million Earths each, and you bang them together at close to the speed of light, you get a big explosion. And so we were able to turn on our um, radio telescopes and our optical telescopes, and we had to map every galaxy in that area to try and find the brand new star which had been created. There are a million galaxies in this plot. So knowing there's been a gravitational wave and finding out the host are two different things. We need to scan something like a thousand of these galaxies using our telescopes. And when we did that, um, we found it was coming from this galaxy. And we looked at, at with the Hubble Space Telescope and that yellow dot was the new star. And we used the radio, the Parkes radio telescope. This thing's actually 64 meters across. It doesn't look like it here. Um, but one day I was sitting at the Parkes telescope and I asked one of my former students if he'd found anything interesting in the data. And he said he'd noticed a flash of radio waves from a random direction in the sky. This was actually a discovery of a new phenomena known as fast radio bursts. And ever since, the Parkes Radio Telescope has been cataloguing these things in the sky. We at Swinburne build a supercomputer that digitizes the data a billion times a second, and it passes it through a machine learning algorithm in order to differentiate human interference from um, genuine signals in the sky. Um, these objects uh, were the subject of my Laureate Fellowship. This is a um, special grant from the Australian Research Council and this was the very first radio flash we saw. It only lasted five milliseconds at any particular frequency, but it swept down in time um, from high frequencies down to low frequencies. And this is the characteristic of the fact that radio waves, when they propagate throughout the universe, travel at a finite speed. We don't know what causes these things. But we've been refurbishing this radio telescope in New South Wales called the Molongolo Telescope. It's one and a half kilometres long. And in order to make it suitable for um, discovering these fast radio bursts, we need to analyse about a million images every day. Doing that by eye is rather trying for a PhD student. Um, and those of you uh, in the know might recognise that the, the graph right in the middle of this um, thing is actually a fast radio burst. The rest of your mobile phones, which you should feel very guilty about, which are polluting the spectrum. So we use machine learning algorithms to pick out the real signals from the mobile phones. And we get these beautiful streaks. This is one of my favorites. Because if we digitize the voltages um, at the billion times a second and process it on a supercomputer, we can actually take out the dispersion sweep and examine the microstructure. So there's something in the universe a billion light years away which has given off this triple humped burst of radiation. And there's a big race on around the world in order to find out what causes these. 
This is the last thing I want to talk about. This is a new um, piece of technology that we are developing. It can be used for CubeSats, but you can also use it for radio astronomy. And it's a little circuit board with the types of amplifiers that are used in your mobile phone to keep the cost down. So we're building 8,000 of these things um, in conjunction with the, the firm Lintec. Um, we put eight of them on a, on a board and we tie them with an analog beamformer and we digitize the data um, at two gigahertz and then send that over RF over fiber, that's radio frequency over fiber, to a bunch of computer games cards in the Molongolo control room, and then we search for those fast radio bursts. We're trying to take this technology that I'm using here um, to schools so that kids can get excited about space and do their own experiments, and we're very passionate they learn about the scientific method, that you'd make, you have a hypothesis, you take observations, and then you can show yourself that science actually works. So we have Mission Gravity, which Jackie can show you outside. Kids put on virtual reality headsets. They get really excited, um, but they also travel to a virtual space station where they make their own measurements, plot graphs, and understand physical relationships. This is all part of the Osgrave Centre of Excellence. It's a collaboration between six universities around Australia. The headquarters is just upstairs. And if you'd like to learn more about it, please come and see me afterwards. We can tell you about how we can capture over a petabyte a day of data, process it using machine learning, and ultimately do science. Thank you.